Fantastic. And this evening's speaker is Dr. Ralph Nurnberger. Dr. Nurnberger holds a PhD in history from Georgetown University, where he then taught international relations as an adjunct professor for 38 years. As a former legislative liaison with the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, Dr. Nuremberger frequently lectures globally and has lent his expertise to the United States government holding positions on the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee, US Department of Commerce, served as the director of Builders for Peace, which was established to assist the Arab-Israel peace process and has served as a fellow at the prominent think tank Center for Strategic and International Studies. In 1994, Dr. Nuremberger assisted in the creation of the India Abroad Center for Political Awareness, which helped strengthen US and Israeli counterterrorism training in India. And still today, remains an associate of the group. Please help me welcome our featured speaker this Dr. Ralph Nuremberger. Well, Neil, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> you're going through all that thing. The, the first thought that occurred to me is this person can't hold a job um, or get the PowerPoint to work, which is another problem. Uh, here we go. Um, and hopefully it will work. Um, <clears throat> Raoul Wallenberg uh, was named as uh, the first honorary citizen that Canada ever had in, in 1985. Um, in 2001, uh, Canada, whoops, there it is, okay. Can Canada named him uh, to be uh, named uh, January 17 to be Raoul Wallenberg Day throughout all of Canada. In 2013, Canada issued a postage stamp honoring Raoul Wallenberg. The obvious question is why? Why would Canada put all of these honors on somebody who never set foot in Canada during his lifetime and who probably didn't have very much interaction with Canadians? Uh, so I will leave it up to each of you to determine whether or not you think this was an appropriate set of honors for Mr. Wallenberg. The way to answer the question is trying to figure out who was Raoul Wallenberg. And the way to start with that, he was born in 1912 and he disappeared uh, on January 17, which is why that date was picked in 1945. Uh, he is uh, a member of the Wallenberg family. And in order to understand Raoul Wallenberg, you need to know a little bit about the Wallenbergs. Uh, by way of background, they are among the most respected and wealthiest families in Sweden uh, for quite a few generations. Uh, for a long time, they were involved in shipping, in railroads, in electronics, in banking, real estate, uh, politics, and diplomacy. Uh, the picture that is up now is Raoul Wallenberg's grandfather, Gustav Wallenberg. Uh, before Raoul Wallenberg was born, uh, his grandfather Gustav had been the Swedish ambassador to China, Japan, and Bulgaria. He was a distinguished uh, diplomat on behalf of Sweden, as well as involved in many of the other activities of the family. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg's father, also named Raoul Wallenberg, uh, was a Swedish naval officer. Uh, Raoul Wallenberg Sr., uh, that's the Raoul Wallenberg, whom we're going to be discussing, again, the father, uh, married a woman named May Wallenberg, uh, or uh, May Wissing. Um, and here is a picture of her uh, holding Raoul when he was uh, a small child. Um, she is the, was the daughter of one of the leading neurologists uh, in Sweden. Uh, they got married in 1911. Raoul Wallenberg was born in 1912. Tragically, Raoul Sr., Raoul, our Raoul Wallenberg's father, died of cancer at the age of 23, three months before the birth of his son. So uh, Raoul Wallenberg never had the occasion to have any uh, meetings with his, his, with his father. May's father, the neurologist, died three months after Raoul's birth. 
And so therefore, uh, Raoul's mother and uh, maternal grandfather were both suddenly widows, unexpectedly in both cases, and raised him together. They were assisted in raising Raoul by his grandfather, uh, Gustav Wallenberg, who offered to take the uh, child's education into his own hands to ensure that he would grow up knowing what it meant to be a Wallenberg. Um, in 1918, when Raoul was six years old, his mother remarried. Uh, she married a man named Frederick von Dardell, who later became director of Sweden's largest and most prestigious hospital. So she married well the second time as well. They would have two additional children, uh, a son named uh, Guy and a daughter named um, uh, Nina. So here's a picture of Raoul Wallenberg with his half brother, Guy von Dardel. Uh, we will see him uh, at the end of this PowerPoint. Uh, he obviously changed in the 70 years uh, between this picture and that one. Uh, in 1923, Raoul's grandfather, uh, Gustav, was named Swedish, uh, the Swedish ambassador to Turkey and arranged for his then 11 year old grandson. Uh, uh, here's Gustav with his grandson, Raoul. Uh, he arranged for his 11 year old grandson to come to Istanbul uh, and spend time with him there. And then he allowed uh, young Raoul to wander around Istanbul on his own, uh, age 11 and 12, uh, ostensibly so that he could learn to become more independent. Uh, he later recalled that this was the first time he ever saw street demonstrations. Raoul had an uncanny ability to learn languages, something I envy. Uh, I'm stuck with just two. Uh, before his teenage years were over, he was fluent in English, German, French, and of course, Swedish. And uh, later on, he added uh, Hungarian and Russian. Uh, here he is as a teenager. Um, he was aware that one of his uh, great grandparents had been Jewish. So he was 1 16th Jewish. And he used to joke, uh, a person like me who is both a Wallenberg and half Jewish can never be defeated. Uh, that said, he was 1 16th Jewish, but this isn't Henry Louis Gates uh, show. Um, Wallenberg graduated from high school um, and uh, his uh, grandfather, Gustav, arranged for him then to study in Paris, where he spent a year in uh, studying at the Sorbonne uh, before transferring uh, to the University of Michigan in 1931. And here he is as a young student at the University of Michigan. He graduated with high honors uh, with a degree in architecture and returned to Sweden in 1935. Uh, later that year, his grandfather arranged for him to get a job in Cape Town, South Africa, in the office of a Swedish company that sold construction materials. After six months uh, in South Africa, he moved to Haifa, uh, where he took a job with a, uh, a bank. Uh, Haifa, uh, obviously in Palestine at the time, uh, as part of the British mandate. Uh, Wallenberg's time in Haifa uh, provided him with his first exposure to Jews who were fleeing from the Nazis, uh, trying to escape from the Nazis uh, anywhere they could. Um, he stayed in Haifa for uh, just under a year and then moved back to Sweden in late 1936, where he took a job in Stockholm with a, an international trading firm uh, called Central European Trading. Uh, and here he is uh, working uh, as an international, uh, an international business. The firm was owned by a man named uh, Kalman Lauer, uh, who was a Hungarian Jew. And so most of the import export uh, that this firm did was with Hungary. Uh, beginning in 1938, conditions in Hungary became increasingly difficult for the Jewish population there uh, under the leadership of Miklos Horthy, the regent of Hungary. Uh, in 1938, uh, the Hungarians passed legislation that was very similar to the Nuremberg laws, which the Nazis had passed in 1935. Uh, essentially anti-Jewish measures to make life for Jews in Hungary extremely difficult. Um, as Hungary moved ever deeper into the German and the Nazi orbit and anti-Semitism expanded in Hungary, uh, it became impossible for uh, Wallenberg's boss and friend, Kalman Lauer, to go back and forth to Hungary. And as a result, Wallenberg began to go to Hungary periodically 
uh, to represent the firm and to do business there. And so beginning in 1941, he would make frequent trips to Budapest and ultimately became fluent in Hungarian as well. Hungary became a member of the Axis powers, that's the Nazis and their allies, in 1940. Uh, the Hungarians, for example, were particularly active in the Nazis' invasion of uh, the Soviet Union in June of 1941. By about 1943, the Nazis had only one criteria a uh, measuring rod to determine whether or not any of their allies were really loyal. And that was, how did they deal with their Jewish problem? Put the words in quotes. Berlin repeatedly uh, insisted that the Hungarians were not uh, taking enough decisive steps to deal with the Hungarian Jews. To make that point even more firmly, uh, Adolf Hitler uh, met with Horthy on April 17, 1943, in Salzburg, in Austria, uh, basically to try to persuade Horthy uh, to allow Hungarian Jews to be resettled in Poland. Uh, the word resettled was uh, obviously in quotes. When Horthy refused to deport Hungarian Jews, uh, Hitler became furious and said that the Hungarians could no longer be trusted to deal with their own Jewish problem in part because Hitler did not believe the Hungarians were ruthless enough against their Jews, uh, the Nazis decided to overthrow Horthy and his government. And this was accomplished within a matter of hours on March 19, 1944. Uh, the Nazi army, uh, accompanied by the Gestapo, moved into Hungary to take over the country. Uh, the head of the Gestapo uh, at the time moving into Hungary was Adolf Eichmann. Uh, Eichmann um, was the 38-year-old chief of the Gestapo's uh, Jewish office. Uh, he had been one of the architects of the final solution, which was done at the Wannsee Conference in January of 1942. He went to, and moved to Budapest with one purpose, and that is to deport as many Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz as possible. Three days after Eichmann arrived, uh, the Nazis uh, removed Horthy and replaced him uh, with a new leader, uh, Prime Minister Dome Stozge. Uh, Stozge um, uh, immediately legalized uh, a virulently anti-Semitic group known as the Arrow Cross Party. Uh, and they were basically a group of Hungarian thugs. Uh, they got dressed in uniforms, and attacked uh, Jews whenever they could. Um, and here's the Arrow Cross rounding up Jews on their own. So the Nazis didn't even have to do that. On April 14, 1944, Eichmann finalized his decision to deport all the Jews uh, in Hungary to Auschwitz or to Poland. Uh, with the assistance of uh, the Arrow Cross, they began to round up Jews uh, beginning in early 1944, uh, in April of 1944, and moving on from there. Um, Eichmann planned to, uh, to take the Jews who were living in the countryside to move them into Budapest uh, so that it would be easier to round them all up at once or in, in tranches, uh, rather than going out and finding them in individual communities. Um, they took uh, the Jews, uh, told them to pack all of their belongings and move them into a ghetto-like area. They then stole all their property. And interestingly enough, or, or tragically or ironically enough, uh, they stored the stolen goods from the private property of the Jews in a Budapest synagogue that they took over and used for that purpose as a warehouse. Eichmann then, uh, because of the way that the Nazis operated, uh, worked out a plan uh, on how do you move uh, the 800,000 Jews or thereabouts to uh, their final destinations. And he figured that he had 45 cattle cars per train, four trains per day, and if he used them effectively, he could transport 12,000 Jews to Auschwitz on a daily basis. They did a test run. On April 29, 1944, uh, the Nazis um, did their first mass transport of about 10,000 Jews 
uh, on April 29 to Auschwitz. And so this is the first transport. This was a test run to see if the system actually worked. Uh, the actual transports began on May 15, uh, and it would take one, days, uh, one day. So here's a picture of Hungarian Jews arriving at Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, this particular group arriving on May 26, 1944. Uh, on a typical day, as mentioned, uh, there were three or four trains, each uh, having between three and 4,000 people on a train for approximately uh, 10 to 12,000 people delivered to the extermination. Uh, this was factory run uh, system. One of those who was transported at this time was Elie Wiesel. Uh, and here's a picture of Elie Wiesel, age 15, when he was taken to Auschwitz. Uh, and of course, Elie Wiesel as an adult. Uh, Wiesel and his mother and sister survived. Uh, this picture, Wiesel is in the lower part of that bunk uh, in the circle, um, uh, just a few days before the camp was liberated. Uh, Wiesel wrote uh, that uh, he heard American bombers flying over Auschwitz and hoped that they would bomb the camps uh, since all the people, the Jews were likely to perish anyway, but uh, that didn't happen and that's a, a different story. Uh, here's Hungarian women who arrived uh, at uh, Auschwitz. Uh, all in all, again, the, the Germans were remarkable uh, in their efficiency and in their record keeping. Between May 14 and July 8, 1944, 437, 402, uh, 437,402 Jews from Hungary were deported to Auschwitz on 147 trains, and of those over 90% ultimately were uh, unfortunately exterminated. Uh, when you got to Auschwitz, uh, some were selected for work details and others were murdered right away. Winston Churchill uh, wrote about this. There is no doubt that this persecution of the Jews in Hungary is probably the greatest and most horrible crime ever committed in the whole history of the world. Uh, here's Hungar another uh, photo of Hungarian Jews arriving in Birkenau in 1944. Here's a picture of Hungarian J Jewish children in front of the gas chambers uh, that they would be marched to uh, a little later on. Um, as a result of the assistance uh, that uh, Eichmann and the SS and the Gestapo received from the Arrow Cross and from the Hungarians, he was able to carry out his genocidal operations in uh, Hungary uh, with only 20 officers and a staff of 100. Uh, absolutely remarkable, the cooperation that he received from the Hungarian people. Now is a good time to shift our story to events taking place in the United States. The American effort to save Jewish lives has received very mixed reviews from historians. Uh, some believe the United States and the Roosevelt administration did what they could, and others have criticized the Roosevelt administration for not acting sooner or more aggressively. One of the examples of the Roosevelt administration doing the right thing, albeit quite late in the process, was the establishment of something called the War Refugee Board. Uh, the War Refugee Board was established in January of 1944, and its sole purpose was to be engaged in the rescue of Jews. Uh, when you look at the role of the Roosevelt administrations dealing with the Nazis, you can divide it pretty much into two different categories. One, immigration prior to the war. Did we have quotas and uh, uh, able to bring Jews into the country? And the second, rescue, once we were in the war and, uh, and Jews were no longer able to get out as easily, uh, what did we do to try and rescue them? The War Refugee Board was the main effort to try and, ref, uh, and, and uh, rescue as many Jews as possible. Uh, the board officers consisted of, uh, from the left, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau, who was a Jewish member of Roosevelt's cabinet and who was the main guiding force behind the War Refugee Board and its establishment, Secretary of War Henry Stimson and the director of the War Refugee Board, John Pelle. Um, a few weeks into the life of the board, um, uh, so that we're now talking the spring of 1944, uh, the board uh, selected a man by the name of Ivor Olsen to go to Sweden to see what he could do 
to try and arrange for the rescue of as many Jews as possible. While he was in uh, Stockholm, he met, interestingly enough, in an elevator, uh, Kalman Lauer. Uh, remember, Kalman Lauer is the head of the firm that Raoul Wallenberg belongs to and is Raoul Wallenberg's friend. Olson asked Lauer uh, if he knew someone who could help with the rescue of Jews in Hungary. And Lauer said, uh, yes, I have a friend named Raoul Wallenberg. He is fluent in, in, Hungary, uh, in, in, in Hungarian. Uh, he can uh, go back and forth there. He knows the city. He, he would be a perfect person. Well, Olson reported back to um, Washington uh, that he would like to appoint Raoul Wallenberg to go to Budapest. And he got a response uh, back from the War Refugee Board saying, why? Uh, who is this Wallenberg? He's not a diplomat. He has no experience in, in rescue. He has no background in doing anything like this. Uh, can't you find someone other than this young man who we know nothing about? Um, uh, Olson wrote back and said, that's very nice. I can't find anyone else. Uh, the next, there's a series of cables going back and forth. And they, the, the, there was a cable that said, what can one man do? And uh, Olson wrote back and said, I have no idea. And he probably doesn't either. Uh, but what's the harm in trying? Olson then arranged for the uh, Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to assign uh, Wallenberg to go to the Swedish embassy. Uh, this is the Swedish embassy where he worked out of and provided him with Swedish diplomatic credentials. Uh, again, he had not been a diplomat before, including a diplomatic passport. And I think uh, here is his passport photo uh, for his diplomatic passport. He was 31 years old. Uh, he was given the title of first secretary to the Swedish legation in Hungary and provided a small office in the Swedish embassy. Uh, before going, he visited his half-sister, uh, Nina uh, uh, Lagergen. Uh, this was the last time that they would see each other. Uh, of course, they didn't know that at the time. Uh, he received his new passport. He packed two knapsacks. He grabbed a trench coat and took off for Budapest. Uh, honestly, he probably looked a lot more like a Boy Scout uh, than a diplomat. Uh, he arrives in his office um, in uh, the Swedish embassy, and uh, he uh, decides, I'm going to save as many people as I can. I have only one question and only one word question. How? And he had no idea. Uh, but after a while, uh, he was able to recruit about 300 volunteers who agreed to help him. Uh, they joined with him because their safety was assured because they suddenly were working in the Swedish embassy. Uh, at the height of his operation, he had somewhere between 350 and 400 people working for him. Uh, when he arrived in Budapest, uh, life for Jews was already hell. Uh, uniform members of the Arrow Cross regularly were attacking Jews in the streets. Uh, as we discussed, Eichmann had already started the process of seizing homes from Jews and forcing them to live in a small ghettoized area in the city. Uh, as many as 100 Jews were living in one small apartment. Uh, Wallenberg realized that um, what Eichmann was doing was clustering the Jews together so that they would be easier to round up and then to deport. Um, after a while, and with discussions with a, uh, an actual diplomat by the name of Per Anger, uh, who became Wallenberg's Swedish aide, they came up with the idea of providing to Jews um, protective passports. Um, here he is distributing the passports to people who would come to his office. Uh, these passports look like this. Uh, here's one that was provided to a, a woman named Lily Katz. Uh, the, uh, the document, as you can see in the bottom, was initialed by Wallenberg. Schutzpass means uh, protective. Schutz is protection in German. So it's a protection pass. And basically what these passes indicated, and they were written in both uh, Swedish and German, is that the person was uh, somehow connected to Sweden and that the Swedes understood the responsibility of protecting Swedes who happened to be in Hungary, and that they anticipated that these people with their Schutzpasses would wind up going to Sweden where they would be 
safe. Sweden was a neutral country at the time. Uh, not one of the people who got a Schutz pass had any connection to Sweden. Uh, Wallenberg was allowed to give out a thousand of these Schutz passes uh, within the first month, he was giving out close to 5,000. Um, once people got these, uh, since they were suddenly semi-Swedish citizens, they no longer had to wear the Jewish star, identifying them as Jews, because now suddenly they were Swedes. Uh, here's a Schutz pass for a woman named Judith Kopstein. Uh, Judith Kopstein, uh, she was 14 at the time. Uh, she survived because she got a Schutz pass, as did the man she ultimately married. He was 16 at the time. Uh, they met a little later on, uh, ultimately immigrated to Canada. Uh, and as far as I know, <clears throat> she is still living uh, in Canada right now. Uh, she's in her 80s. Um, we will come back to her. Uh, well, actually come back to her now. Um, when, the Swede when the Canadian government put together a postage stamp in honor of Raoul Wallenberg, uh, they used uh, Judith Kopstein's Schutz Pass and put it on the postage stamp. She had no idea. And in fact, she didn't know this happened until her daughter bought the Wallenberg stamps at the post office uh, because she knew that her mother had been saved by Wallenberg and recognized the photo of her mother, called her mother up and said, mom, you're on the postage stamp. Um, just a, an interesting side. Uh, here's another survivor holding the pass that saved her life. Um, Wallenberg uh, designed the passes and uh, handed them out as best as he could. Um, when the word got out, uh, here's another uh, Schutz pass uh, for another person. Again, in the lower left-hand corner, Wallenberg's initials. Uh, once the word got out, obviously, as you can imagine, uh, this is the line waiting to get uh, in the hope of receiving a Schutz pass uh, from Raoul Wallenberg. Wallenberg then came up with another idea, and that was to create safe houses uh, for uh, Jews. Uh, here's one more Schutz pass. Uh, these safe houses, um, he claimed, were uh, part of the Swedish legation and part of the Swedish embassy, and therefore, uh, could not be touched by the Hungarians or the Nazis. Um, ultimately, he bought or came up with 32 houses and put 13, 000, 13 to 15,000 Jews, uh, obviously not under the most comfortable conditions, uh, but was able to provide uh, food and lodging and medical care for these people and thus saved another 13,000 people. Uh, he was constantly coming up with additional uh, ways of trying to save people's lives. Uh, writing a letter home to his mother, he wrote, everywhere you see tragedies of the greatest proportion, but the days and nights are so full of work that one seldom has time to react. Uh, significantly, Wallenberg's uh, superiors at the War Refugee Board, uh, particularly John Paley, were very aware in Washington of what Wallenberg was doing. Uh, Pele wrote a letter to Ivor Olson, who was still in Stockholm, said, I feel Wallenberg is working like hell and doing some good. Uh, Assistant Secretary, excuse me, Acting Secretary of State uh, Edward Statinius uh, sent a cable to Olson in Stockholm said, uh, please convey to Wallenberg the sincere appreciation of the humanitarian activities and the courage and ingenuity displayed by Wallenberg himself. It's important because this underscores that Wallenberg's salary was being paid for by the US government. He was, a, he was an employee of the War Refugee Board. So even though he had diplomatic status from Sweden, he was an employee of an American institution at the time. Uh, Wallenberg, uh, here he is, uh, the circle, would go anywhere he knew there were Jews and started handing out uh, passports. Uh, the situation in Hungary got even worse when they had another government change. And uh, Ferenc uh, Zalasi, the leader of the Arrow Cross, became the head of the government. Um, the Arrow Cross would take Jews if they could find them and throw them into the uh, Danube. Uh, for those of you who have been to Budapest, one of the most uh, remarkable monuments are uh, brass shoes that are next to, to the Danube to commemorate those who were thrown into the river uh, and either shot in the river or just left to drown. Um, at this point, uh, 
Wallenberg decided that he might be able to accomplish something, and here he is uh, in his uh, Swedish uniform, if he could meet uh, with Adolf Eichmann. Um, and he does have a meeting with Eichmann. Uh, he goes to meet with him in the autumn of 1944 at Eichmann's uh, uh, office at the Majestic Hotel. Um, Eichmann then makes a, a remarkable offer to Wallenberg. In exchange for a rather large sum of money, he agreed to allow 5,000 Jews to leave. Wallenberg turned it down because he knew if he did this, that would put all the remaining Jews in danger. And why save 5,000 when you can try and save all of them? Uh, Eichmann's uh, response was, you know, not even Swedish diplomats are safe in this country. And the next day, a German truck smashed into Wallenberg car, Wallenberg's car, causing a major accident. Uh, good fortune, Wallenberg was not in his car at the time. Um, in November of 1944, uh, the situation for the Jews got even worse because the Nazis needed the trains for their war effort and took them away from Eichmann. Eichmann then came up with an another idea. If you can't get the Jews to go by train to Poland, let them walk. And so he began uh, a series of death marches, having the Jews in, uh, walk the 125 to 150 miles uh, in the cold and the rain with uh, inadequate food or shelter. And while they were there, the Arrow Cross would come and beat them, and uh, over 10,000 Jews died on, the, uh, on these walks. Uh, Wallenberg would go and he would meet with uh, the death marchers, hand out his Schutz passes, and pull some people off that as well. Uh, it's estimated that he saved another 2,000 people doing this. Another example of what he did, the Dohani Street uh, Synagogue, the Arrow Cross rounded up people, uh, forced them into the synagogue, and then planned to burn down the synagogue. Uh, at this point, Wallenberg found out about this, rushed to the synagogue, and starts screaming, I'm Wallenberg, and I believe that there are Swedes in this synagogue. Are any of you Swedes? And at first, the people weren't quite sure what he was talking about. Then they realized what it was, and he got most of the people out uh, of the synagogue, uh, again, saving them. He made a special effort to try and save uh, uh, children. And he took as his uh, mission after the war, he planned to try and help uh, those children who had been made uh, orphans as a result of the Nazi atrocities. In December of 1944, Eichmann and Wallenberg had their second and last meeting. Uh, the two men were in Hungary for opposite reasons. Uh, Wallenberg was there to rescue Jews. Eichmann was there to kill them. Wallenberg began by telling Eichmann, the war is almost over. Why don't you just give up your task? Eichmann responded by saying that he would remain in Budapest until the last Jew was dead or gone. Uh, that turned out to be false. Uh, soon after they had dinner, Eichmann fled to Austria to save his life. Uh, before fleeing, Eichmann ordered the Nazi general who was in charge there, uh, General August Schmidthuber, uh, to uh, blow up the ghetto. Uh, there were somewhere over 100,000 Jews in the ghetto at the time. The usual estimate that I've seen is 115,000. I've seen numbers slightly higher, slightly lower, but ballpark 100 to 115,000 Jews. And Schmidt uh, Huber got instructions from Eichmann to blow it up. Once Wallenberg found out about this, he rushed to see General Schmidt Huber and said, you are a general, you're not a, uh, a murderer. Uh, if you do this, I will ensure that you will be brought uh, for trial for genocide after the war. Uh, Schmidt Huber thought about it and agreed and pulled the Nazis back. And as a result, in that one day, I, uh, Wallenberg was able to save uh, over 100,000 Jews. At this point, December of 1944, the Nazis were clearly losing the war in Hungary. They began pulling back and the Soviets began to come in. Uh, the Soviets were under the leadership of uh, Marshal Rodion Malinovsky. Uh, he uh, laid siege to the city of Budapest and began shelling the city. It was encircled by the troops. It was a terribly brutal siege of Budapest lasting from December 29, 1944 until mid-February 1945. Um, the Soviets moved into Budapest, uh, killing uh, uh, people, uh, whomever they could find. 
uh, raping women, uh, anything of value was stolen, people were murdered, uh, setting buildings on fire, um, uh, burning and knocking down the bridges. Uh, uh, you can see the destruction of Budapest that was caused during the siege of Budapest from December to, to uh, February of 1945. Uh, again, if you've ever been there, you know this bridge has since been rebuilt and it looks quite uh, different. Um, the Soviets were not quite keen on um, uh, Raoul Wallenberg being there. Uh, they felt that he was the type of man who could cause them trouble. Uh, and so uh, they sent a, uh, a jeep to uh, pick up Wallenberg and uh, because he was dangerous. Uh, he was a, seen as a man of miracles. And the last thing that the Soviets wanted was someone like him around. Um, on January 17, which is why we're talking, why today is Wallenberg Day, uh, the Soviets sent a car to pick up Wallenberg. Um, Wallenberg's last recorded words were, I'm going to Malinovsky's, whether as a guest or a prisoner, I do not know, but I will ask him for food for the Jews in the ghetto. This is the ghetto that he had just saved. Uh, as a quick aside, one of his secretaries uh, was a woman now named Ann Gordon, who lives in Boca Raton, uh, and she was among the last people to see Wallenberg alive, and I've become friends with her uh, when I give speeches down in Florida. Uh, Wallenberg is picked up on January 17, 1945, and he is never seen publicly again. So the rest of this presentation, or the next tranche of it, will be to try and figure out what happened to him. Uh, we are not helped in solving this mystery by comments by the Russian government. Uh, at times they claim they had no idea, at other times they claim the Nazis killed him, at other times they claim they brought him back to Moscow uh, where he died of a heart attack. Uh, they did not want Wallenberg around. Uh, a good example of this is in gratitude to Wallenberg uh, on the pest side of the of Budapest, uh, the Hungarians built a statue in honor of him Prior to the statue being put up, the Soviets uh, took it down and melted it down. Uh, it uh, later was rebuilt uh, in uh, 50 years later. Um, here's Wallenberg. Uh, from what we know, uh, essentially he was taken into um, captivity in January of 1945. Uh, he and his driver were then transported through Romania by train to Moscow. Uh, and it is unclear what the Russians wanted to do with him. Uh, they moved him to Moscow. Uh, maybe they wanted to trade him for um, uh, someone of value, uh, someone that the United States or, the, uh, or others may have captured along the way, or, or a Soviet spy. Uh, they also knew how wealthy the Wallenberg family was. Maybe they wanted him for ransom, uh, but no offers were really made. He was then taken to um, uh, Lubyanka prison, uh, and over the course of decades, uh, people who got out of Lubyanka prison later on claimed to have seen uh, Raoul Wallenberg there. And so it is likely that he certainly lived for at least another decade, possibly even two decades. Uh, remarkably, neither the Swedish government, remember he is officially a Swedish diplomat, nor the United States made any effort to try and get Wallenberg released. Uh, Sweden was increasingly concerned about uh, Soviet expansion. And uh, Swedish King Gustav VI um, uh, made a statement, what do you expect me to do? We can't ransack Russian prisons or declare war for the sake of Wallenberg. Uh, we can't change our policies for the sake of one man. In 1970, uh, Henry Kissinger uh, was uh, uh, informed uh, by the Wallenberg family uh, that they thought that Wallenberg was still alive and uh, asked if Kissinger would ask Nixon to ask Brezhnev to release Wallenberg. Uh, Nixon said he would not discuss Wallenberg with Brezhnev uh, because it would embarrass the Soviets, and Kissinger dropped the matter. Uh, Wallenberg's uh, mother and uh, stepfather, uh, May and Frederick von Dardell, uh, this picture was taken in 1978, uh, the year before both of them uh, committed suicide um, in 1979, uh, they uh, devoted their last decades to trying to find uh, their son. Um, when uh, they, they, they ultimately got so frustrated that in 1979, uh, they uh, overdosed on pills. Um, 
their son, uh, Guy van Dardel, who, whose picture I showed earlier on when he was a child with uh, his uh, older half-brother, uh, Raoul Wallenberg, uh, he, would, he made over 50 trips to the Soviet Union and then to Russia to try and get information. He compiled a 50-page archive of interviews, journal articles, letters, documents, never came up with a real answer. Um, more public attention was paid to him as a result of an American congressman by the name of Tom and Annette. Uh, here he is, Tom and Annette Lantos. Uh, both Tom and Annette, whom I had the good fortune of being uh, pretty good friends with both of them, uh, he has passed away, she is still alive. Um, they were both born in Budapest and both of them had been saved by Wallenberg. Uh, ultimately, they uh, were able to get into the United States. Lantos winds up getting his PhD, winds up being foreign policy staffer for a while to, Joe Bi to Senator Joe Biden, moves to California and gets elected to the United States Congress and makes it as his mission to try and publicize uh, Wallenberg who had saved him. And in 1981, Lantos uh, sponsors a bill to make Wallenberg an honorary citizen of the United States, something that Canada does two years later. Uh, when President Ronald Reagan signs the resolution, Wallenberg became only the second person to be so honored after uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, Lantos uh, stated at the time, it is most appropriate we honor him in this age devoid of heroes. Wallenberg is the archetype of a hero, one who risked his life day in and day out to save tens of thousands of people he did not know whose religion he did not share. 1985, uh, by act of Congress, a portion of 15th Street in Southwest Washington, uh, which is where the Holocaust Museum is located in Washington, was renamed Raoul Wallenberg Place. Uh, there is a now a bust of uh, Raoul Wallenberg in the United States Capitol. Um, uh, in 1989, a rather remarkable thing happened. And that uh, is that the Soviets uh, suddenly contacted uh, Wallenberg's half-brother and said, uh, we found some of his personal belongings, his diplomatic passport, his diary, and his address book, and his cigarette case. They said it tumbled by chance from a shelf in a KGB locker room. Um, but they provided no further information. Uh, it took a long time. But ultimately, Sweden and the United States and others and, uh, began to recognize um, uh, Wallenberg. There, in, in, in 2001, a memorial was created in Stockholm to honor Wallenberg. It was unveiled by King Gustav, Carl Gustav uh, XVI at a ceremony attended by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Uh, Kofi Annan praised Wallenberg, quote, as an inspiration for all of us who act when we can and have the courage to help those who are suffering and in a need of help. Uh, here's Kofi Annan. Kofi Annan, by the way, his wife, uh, Nane Marie Annan, is the daughter of Raoul Wallenberg's half-sister, Nina, and thus uh, is uh, Raoul Wallenberg's niece, um, just as an aside. Uh, significantly, at that ceremony, Sweden's prime minister, uh, Goran Pe uh, Persson, stated, it is clear today that more energetic and purposeful Swedish actions, actions during the 1940s and 50s could and should have led to a more happy end for Raoul Wallenberg and his family. Today, there are memorials to Wallenberg across the, the world. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, or one of the ones I think is most uh, moving, is in London. Uh, there are now several sites in Budapest, including a Raoul Wallenberg Park uh, in Budapest. Uh, there's a new version of the statue that the Soviets uh, had demolished uh, earlier on. Uh, there's a remarkable uh, statue of him in Tel Aviv. Wallenberg was twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, but he did not get it. Uh, his uh, nomination was very controversial because it is unclear if he was alive at the time, and if not, if the prize could be uh, awarded posthumously. Uh, this brings us back to the Canadians naming him uh, an honorary citizen and having a Royal Wallenberg Day and postage stamp. And I, as I started this, it's up to each of you to determine whether this was done appropriately. Uh, anyway, I'd be glad to start and uh, see if any of you have any questions. I will uh, end this, stop this uh, show and uh, uh, slideshow and, and be glad to answer questions if there are any. I don't know how you wanna do this uh, by chat room or have people raise their hands or talk or unmute yourselves. I'll leave that up to Neil. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just 
allowing people to unmute. I am going to just say a couple of things prior to. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, growing up, and, and I often make reference to the education I got growing up in Thornhill, that it wasn't until I entered university, first understood and learned about who Wallenberg was. Um, growing up, my parents would take me to Earl Bales Park and I would see the road, but to me, there was no connection until high school, uh, sorry, until university. And then even just learn more about his life and legacy today, especially the connection to Kofi Annan, um, was very interesting. So I do want to say before we open up that they say that change doesn't happen overnight. And obviously anyone in uh, politics or understanding of diplomacy knows that change works even slower at the political level. Um, Dr. Nuremberg spoke about Ellie Wiesel. And I, you know, as you're talking this evening, I'm reminded of the quote that um, Wiesel said during his, his Nobel Peace Prize speech that says, Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Um, but, and I'm going to say but, and this may be controversial, I think in the case of Sweden, um, Wallenberg understood the position that Sweden was in, using or exploiting maybe Sweden's neutrality during the war in order to save the hundreds of thousands of Jews that he did, that I'm not sure, had he been the diplomat from Sweden, he would have been successful. Um, on that note, I want to thank you for the presentation this evening. Um, and I would like to open it up. I'm going to have the chat. If somebody would like to, um, pose a question, I'm going to ask that you simply just maybe raise the hand so I can see you. And then I'll ask you to unmute. So Doreen Mason waving over there. Hello. Hello. It's Michael Mason. Hello. I would like to bring up a few things to clarify the Canadian beginning of the Wallenberg situation. I was appointed by Tom Lantos and Tipo Neal, who was the Speaker of the House at the US to represent Joel Wallenberg in Canada. There was not, no knowledge in Canada about Wallenberg at all. When I came back to Toronto, I approached the Toronto Star and Ellie Tesher, then a reporter for the Star, came to interview my mother and father and brother who was saved by Wallenberg personally. There was a main story in the Toronto Star, I think in 78, I still have a copy. And it was follow up the second day with another story. A lady called in that she was born in Wallenberg's bedroom in Budapest. And because she was named of Wallenberg's mother, Yvonne. We formed a Wallenberg committee in 1970s and we got very involved because those days we thought Wallenberg was still alive and we were trying to work to get information to pressure Russia to release him. I was given the ambassador to Canada, a Swedish ambassador, to Canada per anger to be our mentor for the Canadian committee. I became quite well known because per anger used to come to Toronto and meet us and get us information. And I went with him uh, speaking to us about Wallenberg and we met uh, Irving Cutler in 1970 to get him involved with the Wallenberg case. One of the articles which came up that we wanted to name Wallenberg an honorary citizen for Canada. I approached the Canadian government and I was told that you have to have a member of parliament to bring it up. So I approached 
at that time the representative was Reverend Cornelius. And I asked him, told him the whole Wallenberg story, which he had no idea. Anybody. And he accepted to represent at the parliament if I joined the party and so on so forth. And we did. We spoke to the kid, the Toronto mayor, and we had a Larry at Urbier Park where we had a Wallenberg Day, where we planted a tree and plaque and so on. We were getting information for seven years. And the nomination, I'm finishing, I'm just going to say. We nominated him for a postage stamp when we were told we cannot issue one because we don't know if he's alive or dead. In 1985, when the Russians presented the passport and his watch to Mr. Uh, Irvin Cutler, my wife passed away and I stopped working for the Wallenberg case. So I just wanted to introduce the involvement that Toronto started to work and remember Wallenberg in the 70s. I still have the letters from the Canadian government. And anyway, I just wanted to introduce a few points that in Canada was involved in the Thank you. He also has lots of different document, different documents to show this, and different papers. And uh, I donated all the information. We spoke to dozens of people who had information about Wallenberg in different jails, and and so on. I donated a box full of. Paperwork to the Toronto Jewish Congress. Thank you. If you okay. need to contact him, uh, you can. Thank you very much. And Doreen, I, I have your email. And, you know, I, I'm sure that, Ralph, you want to weigh in. I just want to say that, you know, it, it's your attendance this evening that I think humanizes the history. Um, as a teacher, it's one of the hardest things to, to show our students that the pictures in a textbook are real places. That history, in fact, wasn't just someone's history, it was their lived experience. And I wanna welcome you here. And you know, that's part of the eternal learning journey. So thank you very much. Doreen, I'm definitely gonna reach out um, to you for sure. Um, Ralph, did you wanna say something? No, but this is... Uh, uh, this is as remarkable uh, what uh, Mr. Mason just added uh, to when I was giving a speech in, uh, on, on Wallenberg uh, at Florida Atlantic University uh, in, in Boca. And uh, <clears throat> a day before the speech, uh, one of my friends said that his uh, aunt plays uh, bridge with uh, Wallenberg's secretary, would I like to meet her? Uh, and it was, and, and not only did I meet her, she was kind enough to come to my speech afterwards and to say, yes, she was one of the small group of people who, who last saw Wallenberg alive. Wow. Or uh, before he disappeared is a better way of phrasing because he certainly was alive for, uh, afterwards and people saw him, but uh, one of the last people before he disappeared. And um, uh, so uh, Mr. Mason, thank you for what you did. Thank you for working with the Canadian government, uh, with Tom Lantos. Uh, I had the good fortune of uh, having a good friendship with uh, Lantos. Um, <clears throat> my uh, friend, Judy Goldstein is, is one of the people who is uh, listening to this talk um, and furiously sending me emails right now. Uh, she has the Tom Lantos Society and her group, Humanity in Action, uh, uh, again, promoting the type of human values that um, uh, AGPI is doing as well. So thank you. Thank you. 
I have a beautiful mm -hmm. picture of the Tan Lantos family they sent with a personal letter. They became quite friendly. And also, I just want to add that Per Anger, who was the yeah. Swedish ambassador to Canada, I worked with him for two, three years. Oh, and me some of the information which is much closer and more, much tighter, what you know. For instance, the Russians didn't send a car for Wallenberg. He had a driver and they drove outside Budapest to Malinowski's head office and him and the driver never came back. Mm -hmm. um I would also be remiss if I didn't mention um, some people that are in attendance tonight and I, I may embarrass her and I, I do apologize, but we are actually um, joined tonight with Sweden's ambassador to India this evening in attendance. And I apologize if I don't pronounce your name properly, but it's uh, Ambassador Charlotta uh, Schleider. So I just want to officially welcome her. She is... Um, I don't know if you would like to say a few words, um, but I do want to, on behalf of AGPI, you know, this is the power. When we talk about the power of one and people just being um, upstanders, it's just bringing people together, which for me with AGPI, our mission while trying to build peace in the world is really to bring people together at a shared table. Um, and we see this with, with Mr. Mason here and obviously with Dr. Nuremberg. And for that, I'd like to welcome the ambassador. Thank you. Um, really, it's such an honor to be part of this. And this has been a, an incredible presentation. Obviously, I've heard many presentations about Waldenberg before, but this was particularly rich and well researched. And I learned a lot of new things tonight. Uh, so thank you for making me part of this. And then um, I, I will stop and let others speak because um, there's obviously lots of participants who have very many interesting things to say. I also would like to correct, I was Sweden's ambassador to Bangladesh. Oh, I, and, I apologize. And now I, I am in New York where I'm part of the mission and I'm their ambassador for sustainable development. Thank you so much for letting me join. Thank you and, and thank you for joining us. And I'm not sure um, if she's still here or if she is in attendance, but I've been told that it's likely that Mrs. Annette Lantos has joined us this evening, which would, um, I'm not sure if she's still on, um, but if not, I'm sad that we, we missed her this evening. Um, there were a few more hands and unfortunately, oh, I'm just looking, there was Jay Levson. Go ahead. Yes, hi, my name is Judy, Judy Meisels Levson. And I just wanted to tell you how important I believe it is that we honor Raoul Wallenberg and really um, do whatever we can to uncover what happened to him, to do him justice. I am here because of Raoul Wallenberg, as is my sister who's on this call, because my grandmother and my mother, who's actually on this call, Eva Meisels, were saved by Raoul Wallenberg. Um, I don't know if she wants to say anything, and I don't mean to put my mother on the spot, but she's, we were raised um, learning about him and, uh, and making sure that we can spread uh, the, the story um, so that more people realize that as you were saying earlier, one person can make a difference. And unfortunately, the atrocities that continue today show that we still have a lot to learn and a lot to do, and every one individual person can make a difference. I'm so glad that you're doing this and spreading the word, and we have to all continue to do so. Thank you very much. And did your mother want to be embarrassed and, and hop on? I don't know, Mom. My sister is there as well. I don't know if she has anything to say. She's muted there. All I can say is I'm <laughs> all I can say to you is that to everybody that all we can do is uh, educate people and to tell them what was going on then in those days and hopefully 
Yuri self and the, all the youngsters that I'm speaking to will not have a future like my past was. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> and, and I think that that's what needs to guide our work uh, is, you know, standing up for, for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all. Um, I don't like saying that Jews were or are the canary in the coal mine. I think that that devalues who we are as a people. You're fading in and out. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? No, yes. Okay. I was saying, you know, the work of AGPI, we work for, you know, advancing human rights and fundamental freedoms for all people that, you know, people should, should have the freedoms that everyone today in Canada and the United States and, and sadly not all around the world, but in, in many places have. And while I don't want to say that the Jews were or shall ever be the canary in the coal mine, I do want our history to, to be the story that guides, you know, the, the story of freedom for all. Um, you know, Ralph, you had mentioned one thing that's going to stick with me, and of course, I'm going to tweet it out tonight, um, and it's probably going to be my saying going forward, is that, you know, you said, what can one man do? And then the response was, I have no idea, but what's the harm in trying? And I, I think that's just it. What's the harm in trying? Because, you know, if everyone just says, well, what can I do? And no one ever does things, then I think we get more of the same. Um, are there any other questions? I believe in education, and that is why my late husband and I were, and we still do talk to thousands and thousands of schools, synagogue, wherever. And of course, being uh, saved by Wallenberg, uh, I talk about Wallenberg. Oh, that's his wife. Such an important, important story. And, you know, it, it needs to be a story that needs to be part of our education. Um, just again, we, we go back to this, this power of one, the power that one person can do to stand up and, and you know, hopefully he survived. Um, but we understand that sometimes doing the right thing is dangerous. And that's often what holds people to say, I'm not comfortable. But where would we be had people like Wallenberg never stand, stood up? Um, whether as a self-reflective piece or just as a people in general. Um, Oops. Oh, that's okay. If, are there any other questions or comments? I'm just looking through the participants here. Feel free to also post something. Just, yes. Hi, Monica America. Weiss. Hi there. Hi, I just want to say something, share it. Yes, I'm also one of the survivors because I was born in Budapest and my mom, may she rest in peace, she had the shoe pass. For some miracle, that's what saved her and saved me. I have family in Israel, I have family in Canada and the power of one is like God, one and only. We all carry a unique quality, the power of one. We should continue and we are definitely in the right track. And I'm happy to be joining this special organization and hope we continue on the same track. Thank you and we should have a lot of success. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, once again, I would like to take the opportunity, um, firstly, to the ambassador. Thank you for making the time to join. Um, we do appreciate it. And definitely, definitely, um, Dr. Nurenberger, I know you and I had speak just a few days ago. Um, you're making me see things differently. So, Raoul Wallenberg I learned about in, in university was a man on a piece of paper. He was a story of one man that, that helped Jews. Tonight, he was one individual that helped people here today that we now have the opportunity to say you know thank you to learn his legacy and to use that to guide us going forward and it was shared in the chat that lantos um once said that the veneer of civilization is paper thin that we are its guardians and we can never rest 
So on that note, Dr. Nuremberg, thank you very much uh, for making the time. We really appreciate it. On behalf of AGPI, I want to thank you. Um, your words are going to stay with me for sure. And I know especially that just that one piece, you know, I have no idea, but what's the harm in trying, I think needs to be the mantra. It's better to try and fail than never to ever try. So thank you very much to all of you who joined us. Please thank you. You know, you're what you're the reason we do what we can. We had at one point almost 60 people join us this evening. That's 60 more people that know his story, 60 more people that can go into the world tomorrow, share with our children, our grandchildren, and our friends. And please, it is so much easier just to be nice and good to people. So on that note, thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and please stay safe and be healthy. Take care. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the most wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. That was outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All the best, all of you. Bye, Mary. We'll be in touch. That's our weekly call. Merica, thank you very much. Thanks, Amelia Niels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, go to sleep. Oh, it's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> She's in Ireland. She joins us for all of them. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Leora, thank you very much as well. Yeah, thank you. What a powerful, powerful evening. Honestly, I, I, I forget how special all of the people are to this organization and so many people that we get to meet, but this was extraordinary. It really was like to meet people who were touched and who've been saved and it's, it's emotional. It's gut wrenching really, but it's just so amazing and so powerful. So thanks for letting me be a part of it tonight. It was thank really, you very really much. All special. the best. Mr. Take Mason, care. you are uh, a blessing, really. Well, I'm so grateful to get to see you, even though it's just on Zoom, but what a, an absolute pleasure and an honor, really. Oh, thank you. Just so special. I am a survivor, a child survivor from Auschwitz. And I didn't know anything about Wallenberg until I came back, survived, and fought my family, who was saved by Wallenberg personally, and my big brother, he picked him up and took him into his office and gave him a Schutzmaß personally. Wow. So when I heard his name and from Lentos, they were looking for help. I just volunteered to donate money. Of course. And they said, no, we want more than that. So I went to Washington and Thank you very much. Wow, all that effort. Unbelievable. Yeah. There's okay. so many small things came out, you know. I met people from Russia, a KGB colonel who received Wallenberg. He took him, and he was the one who took him to Vladivostok prison. I met the woman who was born in Wallenberg's bed in Budapest, in the safe house. So, a lot of personal he has, he has a lot of information. I'm so curious what you think happened, ultimately. I'm more interested in knowing what you think more than anyone else. Doreen, I am going to be reaching out because I want to continue this conversation. Oh, and, it's extraordinary. You know, I, I think, Leora, I'd love to bring you in and just to learn more and see if we can hear that story even further. Um, it's that human side that I think our students are missing. And, and he's more than just a piece of paper in our textbook. Well, I'm telling you, you'll be shocked to know that young kids have no idea who he is. I have a daughter at chat. And if you ask her today who he is, she didn't know. And I think that's what's sad is that these are these incredible people and extraordinary stories that our kids don't know. Michael, so, as I, you know, Michael has spoken at many schools, the churches, um, diff many different places in the past. 
Um, I found that the students sort of were so interested to hear about it. There wasn't a sound for an hour. Nobody even wanted to go to the washroom. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah.